everyone, welcome to episode 35 of Pixel Feet Radio, and I'm here with my friend Jody Krangle. How are you, Jody? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. So today, I'm very excited about this one. This is, I think this is going to be one of my favorite ones because we have a lot in common. And uh, she doesn't know this yet, but as we get talking, I'm, I'm going to go into it. Okay. Uh, but, you know, we're going to be talking about how you can use uh, audio branding to help uh, your company or podcast or, you know, your business or clients' businesses, right? Uh, audio marketing can be very, very powerful if used correctly. And then uh, I've always been, uh, um, I want to say attracted to like voice acting and voiceovers and stuff like that, because it's really crazy how people can change their voice and, uh, you know, put it to a character or add it to a brand. You know, it's, it's, there's certain, certain brands that you just hear the voice and you recognize it. Like my wife and I would joke around all the time because we'll be watching TV. And if there's a commercial on or a, or a cartoon or something, for some reason, don't ask me why, but I'm able to pick people's voices like that, that I'll, I'll go like, that's George Clooney. You know, it's like, and she's like, really? How do you know? I'm like, I can just tell. Or like, you know, these obscure people too. And I say obscure, we're like, you know, uh, when I say like, um, uh, I can't think of anybody at the, uh, on the spot, of course, right now. But it's like certain voices that are not super A-list actors. But I, I want to say D just to throw a letter out there. And I can just pick him up from like, you know, because I, sh I saw a couple episodes of one show. Mm -hmm. It's crazy how powerful a voice can be, right? Yeah, it really is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So before we get into it and how we can, you know, how you help people with it and how, you know, uh, business owners and entrepreneurs can do it themselves. Let's talk a little bit about your background. So how did you get started? Let's tell everybody how you got started and how you got to where you're at today, because this is a very interesting story. Well, it's, <laughs> it's a long one. <laughs> That's all right. That's um, right. I, yeah, I guess it depends on how far back you want me to go. But uh, basically, I volunteered my time at the CNIB, which is the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, for around a year mm -hmm. in 95, 96. And at the time, we were actually using reel-to-reel -reel tapes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so like the, you know, the before oh, I did it. I did it. <laughs> I'll, I'll be turning 40 this next Monday. So trust me, I did it all. I did all editing with beta tapes, VHS tapes, you know, all that stuff. So I know. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I, uh, but I was fascinated by the tech as much as I was by the voicing. And I did right. that for around a year. And that's sort of where I figured out that voiceover was a thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't really know until then. And I was doing internet marketing and SEO. And I continued doing that up until around 2007, when Google became the only game in town. And I got bored <laughs> right but home before that though this is the one the one point i want to bring up oh yeah you actually sold computers i did yes i did yeah when the 386 sx was new i was selling computers and yes. this is where we're to totally gonna geek out because <laughs> okay. i still to this day build my own awesome i build my own still to this day okay. and my first computer not my own but the first computer in the house was an apple II. that's how old i am my dad was you know I was lucky enough that my dad had the means to buy an Apple II when it came out back in the day. Yeah. And then my next computer after that, and this is what this caught my eye, was a 286. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. That I built with a friend of my dad's, one <laughs> of my dad's friends. And then after that, the whole, I, you know, I started playing with DOS and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Oh, my God. I'm talking about DOS. That's before yeah. Windows, kids. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's why I didn't even from pc to mac i yeah i'm more comfortable with a pc <laughs> yeah me too and i didn't even know english at the time i didn't grow up oh. here so i'm sitting there with an english spanish dictionary trying to figure out dos and giving it commands and what that's they great. mean that's yeah. how we all did it all my friends and i yeah and uh so that's when it started it was 286 uh, 286 386 486 Pentium 75 115 and then it just and now we're here i mean it just it in the 90s it was just like a wave of i remember uh best buy Having, when we moved to the States, having mm -hmm. the ads in the weekends. And literally, you would buy a computer one weekend, and the next weekend, the next Pentium was out. And you're yeah. like, oh, my God, I just bought this. Like, you couldn't keep up, right? It was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. And now we've gotten to the point where they're not really increasing the processing speed. They're just making the sizes different. So right. everything's getting smaller with the same processing speed, and smaller things are containing more files. So. Right. So it's kind of like miniaturizing everything, but it's not really increasing its its processing power. 
it's not on on the exponential rate that it used to be by far. Well, the cool thing about nowadays is that you can build depending on your needs. Mm -hmm. So if you're a gamer, you can go out on a super duper video card that's like you know 500 bucks on its own mm -hmm. and still have like a like a decent process or nothing crazy and you still you'll be able to play games at full you know full settings but yeah. if that's not what you're doing if you're doing like editing or you know photoshop and and premiere and all that kind of stuff you can buy a good processor and a decent you know it's like mix and match now which i think it's super yeah. cool you know what i mean i've always told people when like even way back then and and it's becoming even more important now memory is really where it's at you need as much memory as you can possibly get into your computer because otherwise the processing power is slowed down just trying to keep up <laughs> right and and you can buy space hard drives are a dime a dozen these days you can buy space for almost nothing now right. but but memory is you know the memory to keep up with the processing power is what you yeah need. absolutely especially if you're yeah. using chrome like chrome is known yeah. for like draining oh <laughs> like yeah. your memory so. well, any tab you open it's like a completely separate browser <laughs> like, <laughs> it's what <crazy>. is that <laughs> yeah i still i don't know why they haven't figured that out okay all right we're getting sidetracked anyway. with all the computer yeah. stuff i can talk about this all day so <laughs> So could all I. Right. So yeah. <laughs> you did that for a while. So yeah. then what happened after that? So you were selling, you were doing, you were selling computers, which I'm sure it was, you know, crazy back then. And yeah. then you move into what after that? Actually, I sold software uh, for, okay. for a medical company for a little while. Um, and then I went to university and uh, I did that. And, and I, I went from selling computers on the side to being a secretary really for about five years. And at the time, you know, not a lot of people knew word processing. Not a lot of people knew how to type. Like it wasn't as big a thing as, you know, it wasn't an everyday thing like it is now. I have right. to tell you the most important uh, subject that I ever took in junior high school was typing. <laughs> Me too. In high school. Yes. Oh it, it was God. like QA, QA, Q. And before that, since I grew up with my own computers, I, I, I just typed my way. And yeah. it took me forever to like correct myself on how to type properly. Yeah. And I'm not gonna lie, I can type really fast now because I've been doing it my yeah. whole life, but yeah. I still like, it's not the proper way to do it. Well, but touch typing, right? When you were learning touch typing, when I was learning it, I think it was grade seven actually. And we were doing it on real typewriters. Me like, too, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you, like, you had to press those. Yeah, <laughs> but I was too ADD for it. I'm like, I can't sit yeah. here and just hit QA for an hour. Like, I can't do it. <laughs> and the people who did, did, you know, learned the correct way. I'm just like, you know, <laughs> but I can do it without looking at the keyword. So, you know what? It works. But anyway. It's so hugely useful. Oh, my God. I have used okay. it every day of my life since. Yeah, great. of course. Yeah. So, all right. So, you became a secretary. Yeah. I, I can't believe you went from sales to like a secretary because I have figured in sales. I don't know. I did sales for a long time. I mean, well, I've been in sales my whole life. I will tell you that as a woman in tech, <laughs> yeah, especially back then, it was not very friendly. Um, I can only, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. like this, this is like the early '90s, basically. Oh, yeah. There's um, no such a thing as PC culture, like anything. I'm sure no, people were talking smack and all that. Not, it was not friendly. It was not good. Um, the clients that came in deliberately were trying to trip me up because I was a woman. Like they, you know, they didn't believe. Yeah, I'll show her. I'm your more than she does. Yeah, I can. You know, I can only like, imagine, which is yeah. so dumb. You I, know. Yeah. I mean, and uh, like, I, I'm sure it still happens these days. I'm, I'm sure. sure it does. But, but it was pretty bad back then. And so at the time, I was like, you know. I don't need to do this. <laughs> right. No, I don't blame you. Done. I'm done. I just want to be in a really quiet office where no one comes in. And all I do is my work for like two hours in the morning. And then I have like the rest of the day free to do whatever. Right. <laughs> and that's right. Right. What ended up happening. And while I did that, I got a modem. The, the office got a modem. And I taught myself how to be on the Internet. And I taught myself how to do graphic design. And Crazy. This is all while I'm sitting here doing this really kind of boring <laughs> secretary right. job, which didn't take much brain power. And, you know, uh, I got along well with everyone in the office. It wasn't like there was a problem or anything. But I did that for five years. And then at the end of that five years, well, actually, right before the end of that five years, I offered the company 
um, I, I offered to uh, make a website for them because the websites were just starting. This was like 95. Oh, something wow. You were, like, you were like ahead of the game. I mean, <laughs> 95, I was logging onto AOL and just be like, oh, my God, what is this? Like, I yeah. thought AOL was the internet, you know? Yeah. So I, you're out that uh, Netscape I was, browser. I was already in there. I was I was doing stuff. I was fascinated by the whole idea of it. And mm -hmm. um and and what ended up happening was as a secretary, you don't get paid all that much, right? And I get right. it. You're you're a secretary, you know, like this is what that kind of a job is kind of dead now. Like you don't see those kinds of jobs anymore. Right. <laughs> um, but at the time, you know, I was making a a, a minimal salary and whatever. Sure. And I was trying to up my game. I was trying to be more useful to the company. So maybe they would pay me more. You know, maybe this would be something else I could do. Well, no, they decided, oh, you've demonstrated that you can do this neat new skill. We're just going to make that a part of your job description. Yeah, and we're just going to take advantage of you and charge people thousands of dollars for it and pay well, you the same. Yeah, yeah. So, so basically what I did was I looked around, I found out who else could benefit from having a website? I found a data recovery company that was around the area that I was working and I faxed them a version of my version of their new website. Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> and they hired me. <laughs> Why, who wouldn't? I mean, you faxed them a, a freaking <laughs> picture of the website. That's amazing. <laughs> But it was fun. It was fun. So, so That's I got awesome. myself a new job and I went and did that. And while I was at that data recovery company, and let me tell you, data recovery companies, holy crap, that's as competitive as porn. I am telling you. Like those data recovery, really? Oh my God. Yes. Like the, the companies between themselves, they're so, I don't know if it's still like that now, but this was like 96. Sure. You know? So, mm -hmm. It was a, Yahoo was still kind of a thing, and right. uh, and and you know. Oh my God! I just, I just thought about this. Around. Did you think? Did you think of buying stocks on like Yahoo and Google and all that? Because no, I mean, I that didn't even cross my mind back then. I was. I did tell my dad. I did tell my dad. I'm like, Dad, yeah. put all your money in Google. Like now, today. He's like, No. What are you Google, talking about? And now he. That. I still bring it up to this day. It pisses yeah. him off. I was like, I told you. <laughs> Google wasn't a thing yet. Like it no, wasn't, it, wasn't. Even, it didn't even exist yet. And no. so, you know, Alta Vista asked Jeeves, um, uh, web yeah, crawler. Yeah, yeah, there were a whole bunch of them. But yeah. what ended up happening was while I was also doing the website, I ended up doing some customer service and I ended up doing uh, media buying. So they taught me how to buy the banner ads that they were running. Oh which my God, you were like at the ads. beginning. That is oh, so yeah. amazing. Meanwhile, I'm just like oh, playing yeah. stupid games on my computer and partying in high school. I was what, 15? <laughs> oh man, I wish I knew all this. Like, I knew, you know what's crazy? I remember sitting there when I started playing like online, when, you know, and it was very, look, if, if you're a kid, and when I say a kid, anybody who's like 30 and under at this point, like back then it was just, so basic. I mean, it, it, you couldn't really, and I knew, I knew, but I was still too young, but I knew, see, this is where, where some people, you know, have that drive to become successful right away because they came from absolutely nothing. I, you know, I think I talked about this, before. I grew up with money. So mm -hmm. I was like, when I was 15, I wasn't worried about how to make money. I was just like, mm -hmm. Hey, I'm just in high school and this is what I'm supposed to do. Like, I don't have a care in the world until I went to the real world. Right. Sure, yeah. And that's the difference between somebody who was maybe my age back then, or maybe a bit, maybe a little bit older? Like Gary, you know, Gary V talks about it all the time. He's, he's, you know, he, they were an immigrant family. You know, they didn't have anything. Mine, I was an immigrant too, but we had money. You know, I grew up with money. I'm not gonna lie. So it's a different situation. That's what makes it. He found a way. Like I would sit there and be like, "Man, I gotta figure out a way how to make money. This is gonna make money." I knew the internet was gonna make money yeah. and lots of it, but I didn't know. You know, I never took the time to sit there. It's like, how can I figure this out? You know, the need wasn't there. Yeah. And that's what makes a difference. And, and you were trying to figure this out, which is amazing. Like you were well, buying banner ads. Yeah. Yeah. All while it was going on. I have to say, like, I, I never, uh, I never really had um, any money problems when I was growing up either. It wasn't really an issue for us. But at the same time, my parents always instilled in me the idea that I needed to make the money I wanted. So, right. so it was never really a, oh, here's money. Go do what you want to do. It was like at 11 years old, I was mm -hmm. going door to door with Regal sales, Regal 
you know, sales uh, catalogs, getting right. people to buy things like greeting cards and stuff like that. And door to door. Oh my God, you'd never do that. Oh, no, I, I've done it. I, that's how I started too when I was a kid. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, the whole like, but they, that's they, what I was saying. Like, I just didn't dive hard enough because I was so yeah. much else. You know what I mean? When <laughs> yeah, I should have just yeah. been focused on that thing. Yeah. You know? But it teaches you a lot when you when you're yeah. that young and you understand that money has a purpose and that it's right. not just to buy this thing, but you know it's also for like there's more to it. You know, sure. <laughs> when you no, realize there's more to it, then then there's a drive there, and I think yeah. the drive has always kind of been with me. So I don't like standing still. I have never liked standing me still. Yeah. So. Yeah. So one thing leads to the next thing leads to the next thing. Um, I started a songwriting, um, a website, but really what it was, was before message boards, because it started in 95. Mm -hmm. I would ask people through uh, uh, email, um, put up, I put up like a really rudimentary kind of HTML page. And I'd ask, a, I'd ask a question to a songwriting community uh, out there in the ether of the internet. Mm -hmm. And people would email me back and let me know what their answer was. And when they emailed me back, I would post their answer on the HTML page. So it became these like songwriting interview pages that just kind of populated themselves because people were interested in communicating. <laughs> right, that's pretty <laughs> and awesome. Before message boards, there wasn't any way to really communicate with one another unless you were on AOL or CompuServe or something like that. There mm -hmm. really wasn't, like it was only just starting. And from there, I put up lists of songwriting competitions and uh, songwriting organizations and things like that. And it kind of expanded into this uh, community web page website called The Muse's Muse. And I had that on from 95 until I think it went off in 2016. And wow. Yeah. And I had a message board. I had an early podcast. I had a podcast and podcast. It was internet radio, really. Right. And 2002, doing real audio. <laughs> oh, I remember real audio. Yeah, yeah, I remember real audio. Yeah. And Winamp. Yeah. I used or to use Winamp. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, like, I had a, a friend, uh, I believe he was in Colorado somewhere, and he was uh, another songwriter, and he loved producing stuff, and so he would put the show together, and awesome. we'd post it together as real audio and put it up on the website, and, you know, over the years, I had articles written for the site and columnists and, um, you know, competitions and all sorts of uh, really interesting things going on, and you know, it was just, a, it was a labor of love, but I learned a ton. Yeah, and I can and, imagine. Well, I learned from promoting my own website for zero dollars <laughs> is what ended up, what it I mean, back know. then organic was like yeah. a lot easier and yeah. well, a lot cheaper too. Obviously yeah. if you pay for traffic, but. Yeah, but you know, content is still king. The, Absolutely, the that's, that's why I'm doing this. Well, I'm doing it because I love it, but too, well, it's like it helps I a lot, do. right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. But I learned tons of lessons just doing that myself. And so what happened was when I left the data recovery company, that was around 97, I would say, uh, I went to work with a uh, software gaming company called Zillions of Games. And this was really interesting because I'm north of Toronto. Uh, one of the guys was in California near LA, I believe, and another guy was in Germany because he was serving, I think he was uh, at the consulate, like the U.S. consulate in Germany, in Berlin. Okay. And, uh, and, and he, he, these two guys, the guy in California, the guy in Berlin, they had written this software gaming company. They'd written this, this gaming software that was for board games. And it was a um, evergreen type of program, and and people could make their own graphics and add it to the, like the engine. They actually created the engine, yeah. and people could come in, and like yeah, okay. exactly, yeah. So it was called Zillions of Games, and they wanted to sell it, so they wanted to go and find a publisher of some kind, and they brought me on because we met through uh, like online channels. Uh, actually, uh, Jeff, the guy in California was a fellow songwriter. And so he knew of my Muses Muse website and he oh hired God. me on to be the director <laughs> of marketing for his software company. And so I, I went to E3 with them and oh my God, that was weird. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that weird? Oh, because you never met him in, in, in person or? No, no, no. Meeting them was great. Meeting them okay. was great. E3, E3 was weird. <laughs> what year was this? What year, what 1999. Year was this? <laughs> oh my God. 99. Yeah. What's going on in 99? Yeah. I can't even put them all together. Oh, 
Yeah. Uh, really early. So um, E399, that means yeah. the PlayStation 2 was around at that point because I was in college. Could be. So yeah. So that I'm just trying to put in my head like where yeah. in technology we were at the time. Yeah. So Oh, so 99, that's the year of Napster, PlayStation 2, the first Xbox. Changes. Yeah. So, all right. Yeah, it was it was really, it was fascinating, very weird, and very overwhelming. <laughs> Which makes sense why you made that comment uh, that you brought up, that if you could put a chip in your head, you would totally do it. I totally I would. have great yeah. news for you because I say the same thing. It's like <laughs> when the technology is there, I want to do it. And if something yeah. happens to me, I want you to download my brain into a server yeah. so that you can bring me back. Like I tell that my wife all the time. And she thinks, yeah. I'm like, I'm not joking. It's going to yeah. happen. Yeah. Uh, good news is Elon Musk just announced uh, the Neuralink. So Ooh. did you see that? I did not. He just Google it or, or whatever when we're done on YouTube. Oh, the yeah. whole presentation is there. So at first... It's basically obvious. It's like that big. Uh -huh. It goes in your head. And at first, obviously, it's going to be used for like, you know, Parkinson's disease or any type of, you know, this is to cure those type of diseases. Because yeah, yeah. I guess, I mean, this is like the, the dumb explanation of what I got from it. Like if you can't walk and it's because your spinal cord can communicate for it stops at one point. I guess that's why you can't walk on your spinal mm -hmm. cord. Mm -hmm. Well, this way it's going to connect. You know, it's going to send information from your brain to that specific part of your spinal cord, okay. giving instructions. So even if it's broken up right here, there's a way they can get around it with like, I don't know, a cable or something. I don't, it's yeah. crazy. That is so, so basically, crazy. it's insane. That's all I got to say. So yeah. look it up, Neuralink. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's going to be pretty awesome. Wow. Anyway, so, all right. So yeah, now I can understand. Nine. This is like, <laughs> like yeah. I told you, it's long. <laughs> no, it's great. I love it. I'm, I'm, you know what's funny? This is like the favorite part of people who listen to this thing. <laughs> like, I love the background part. I'm like, yeah, me too. That's why I do it because it, it tells a lot about a person, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I want to say, yeah, 99.99% of the people that I've had on so far and I plan on having on, they're entrepreneurs or self-made people. So it's like, there's something we have in common, you know, yeah. people that do what we do, whether it's, you know, audio or video or, mm -hmm. you know, what I do for them in media buying, there's something, there's a drive in us that not everyone else has. It's true. Um, Perfect example, you know, my my wife, she's like, she's an attorney. She's one of the top attorneys, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. from her class. And, you know, she's very successful. But she's the type of person that she needs uh, specific instructions of what needs to be done and everything has to be outlined. And it, God forbid, if something comes up, she'll figure it out. But it's like, oh, my God, I didn't expect that at all. How did that happen? Yeah. Meanwhile, people like us, it's like, yeah, all right, I got to figure it out, I guess, well, you know, and, and that's what we do. An attorney, so... <laughs> Yeah, I, I yeah. you know that that's a, a set of knowledge and and skills that I would never even dream of having. No. So, no, 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 oh my no, god, no. yeah, never, <laughs> never. I have no desire whatsoever to be an attorney, yeah. and I know her attorney friends too. And I can tell yeah. right now, ninety nine percent of them don't like being an attorney. It's crazy. Oh. Like I could never do it. Yeah, it's crazy. It's so awful. I can't imagine being in a job that I would rather not do. That's kind of. That's that's even why I made the transition. So like when I was doing internet marketing and media buying and all of that stuff, um, I got the beginnings of it from the data recovery company and then more of it doing more marketing and trying to get the software company sold um, when I was working with them. But then by 99, I was doing internet marketing and SEO for a company in Albuquerque, New Mexico, believe it or not, because internet. <laughs> right, right. That's, um, that's amazing. Yeah. And, and so I learned more from them. And then when I left that, uh, you know, by like the early 2000s, I was out on my own doing internet marketing for clients that I found just on the internet that, that found me. And it worked great for a while. And then, like I said, in 2007, I got so bored, so bored because <laughs> Google was it. Like there was nothing left anymore. Right. And at that point I was like, well, this isn't art anymore. This is, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what this is, but it's not something that fulfills me anymore. And sure. I've had a few of those moments in my life where, you know, it's, it's the figurative Oh my God, close the door, lean back on it, slide down and go never again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I've done some it. Some of those moments, like that mm -hmm. was one of those moments in 2007. I was like, I am done. I am just done. I'm bored out of my skull. I need to do something else. 
And that's when I made the switch to voiceover. <laughs> I'm the same way. Like, uh, you know, again, like my wife, when we go on vacation, she hates it because she knows that if I don't have activities planned out like a kid to keep me busy, <laughs> I'm going to be miserable. Like yeah. I, she, if it was up to her, we will lay by the pool, the beach all day long and do nothing. Just, yeah. you know, have drinks or whatever. I'm like, that's great and all, but I have to do something. Like I'm not, I didn't pay all this money to come hang out at a pool at a resort yeah. when I live in Florida. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so yeah. And I get, I get super, I call it mad, mad, uh, shiny object syndrome. Like oh, I have literally a board to my left and I'm sure that you guys have seen it. The people who know this channel, mm -hmm. like all my videos every once in a while, it's just ideas that are sitting there and it's like, I want to execute them, but I, I can't, I just can't because I got to like, concentrate on the few things that I already have enough on my plate. And when I look at that board, I'm like, I can't as much as I want to do it. I can't do it because it's like you, you said, it's like, I took this thing as far as I can take it. Uh -huh. Yeah. I can keep learning and doing more with it, but I need something else. I need, I want to, you know, there's, I got to get my, I, lo I love the building part of it and taking it to a certain level. And then be like, you know what? That was I weird. No, we're still on. That's crazy. I don't bug. know what that was. Woo. What are you watching? That little countdown just came on all of a sudden. All right, no, we're good. Us off because we were talking too much. Yeah, probably. No, <laughs> it's limited. All right, so, so you made this switch to audio, which is super interesting. So yeah. why audio? Out of all, out of everything you've done, because that's that's, I mean, that is so niche down, which yeah. I find super. I mean, now it's normal, but back then, you know, what made you go that route? Well, um what really hasn't been running through all of this, you know, very strange meandering route towards where I am now is that I have always been a singer. So I have been singing all my life when my parents put my sister and I to bed. It wasn't story time. It was sing along time. My dad's a guitar player. My mom's a singer. And that was what we did before bedtime. So I've grown up with that. I have always loved that. And uh, as I mentioned in 95, 96, when I did that CNIB thing, I, I started to understand that voiceover was a thing. And I've always loved the audio and songwriting was a part of the message board and the, the big community and, you know, the songwriting resource thing that I put together uh, the Muse is Muse, that was all running through all of that. So it's not like it kind of just happened out of the blue. It's been running through everything that I do from like, you know, birth until, yeah. you know, now. Um, it's just that I hadn't really focused on using it for a purpose. That makes <clears throat> so, sense. Yeah. So in 2007, I decided to use it for a purpose. And uh, I went online because I'm an internet person and that's what I do. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's what so, I would, that's what I would have done. So yeah, of course. Exactly. Yeah. So I went online and I wanted to learn everything I possibly could about voiceover. And at the time, a message board was where I found the most information. So I went on this message board and I asked people uh, you know, for their advice. And I went and I got a uh a couple of demos done before I was way before I was ready, like, <laughs> like making all the classic mistakes that people starting in a new business yeah. make because they just don't know what they don't oh, know. Yeah. That's how you learn. You know, exactly. And, um, I remember having these professionally produced and then going on the message board and saying, here's my bright new shiny demo. Yay. <laughs> and, then, and then everybody on the message go message board going, wow, that sucked. <laughs> oh, man, that's heartbreaking. That's that, rough. That was rough. Yes. Yeah. Because really we rough. people people no. don't hold back in the comments. Like, like, no, they totally do not. Um, no, I mean yeah. these were nice people. They were not doing it to be, you know, mean. I don't know but they're like, like, yeah, that sucks. We need here, to fix yeah. Yeah. They're, they're not doing it to be mean. They were doing right. it to give me a, do a, a dose of reality. <laughs> yeah. And. That's good. Uh, yeah, and so one of the guys who was the most vocal about telling me how much it sucked <laughs> was a 30-year-plus actor from Chicago. And mm -hmm. uh, I private messaged him on the message board and said, look, I understand this really sucked. What can I do? Help. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm ready to take instruction. What do I do now? <laughs> you know, sure. and, and um, this was... Well, this was like to early 2007. Well, not early. Um, it was actually late 2007. And um, at the time, I 
I mean, really, what there weren't all that many options for remote connections like we have now, like Zoom yeah. was, was like a twinkle in someone's eye. And, uh, you know, none of this stuff was easy. So what we did was he sent me scripts through email. And then he said, say this script, perform this script for me, send me an MP3, I will critique it, you can try it again, send me another MP3, I'll critique it, etc, etc, etc. So awesome. for six months, this guy took me under his wing and basically taught me how to act because I had no acting skill at all. I was a I was a performer. I had done music. I had sung on stages, but I had not actually thought of how to perform a script so that it sounded natural and like I actually cared about what I was saying, you know? Right. <laughs> and no, that's, awesome. that is, that's an acting skill. That is not just musicality that is there's acting in that and i didn't realize any of that before i got started so yeah so over time i you know and it was like pulling teeth like it it was not, <laughs> it, did not it didn't come naturally to me it just did not and i had a lot more to learn but oh my god that beginning with him was gold and and he just did it out of the goodness of his heart because he didn't charge me a dime it wasn't like you know, he even made some spots for me to put on a new demo. Like that's just, really cool. Uh, just being nice. Like I was, you know, yeah. all this from being highly critical of a, uh, you know, of a, a demo that I, you know, still felt the sting from. <laughs> right, right. Because you probably worked so hard on it only to like yeah. be destroyed. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's another lesson be able to take constructive criticism, you know, yes. like it's, it's, it's not, don't take it personally because oh. you can't, you can't get better at something unless you understand the mistakes you're making and people are going to tell you those mistakes. And if you ignore them and just say, Oh, you don't know what you're talking about or, Oh, this sounded fine when really you don't know, <laughs> yeah, right. then, no. You know, you need to be able to to take that. You need a little bit of a thicker skin. <laughs> well, it's like I tell people, you know, if you're thinking about going on your own or even sales, you know, because, it's, mm -hmm. you know, when you're in your own sales, it's, you're in sales, basically. Sales and marketing if you have your own business. Mm -hmm. So it's like get ready for rejection daily. Yeah. So, oh, totally. You yeah. know, and don't take it personal. It sucks. I mean, still to this day, you know, if I have a deal that doesn't go through, it, it bothers me. And it's just yeah. like it's part of it, you know, like what well, could have done better, blah, blah, blah. Which is, you know, it's like, I guess it's like acting, you know, when you're doing casting calls, a million casting calls a day and you get them rejected, 99% of them, it sucks well, no. when you take it personal. Here's the thing. You won't even know you were rejected. They don't tell you. The only oh, they don't? I didn't no. Even know that. Oh, no. The only way that you know you got the job is if they call you to book the job. <laughs> oh, so you could be just sitting there waiting for a year if the script has to be yeah. redone a million times and you have no idea? No. Wow. They won't, no, they won't. They won't tell you unless you get the job. They won't tell you. I didn't like, know that. Yeah. So I, I audition all the time. That's, you know, that's part of what I do. Very right. rarely do I actually get any feedback. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. I never yeah. even thought about that. Yeah. So the only reason, the only way that you'll know if you're improving from a coaching session or whatever is if you happen to book a couple of jobs right after. <laughs> wow. You know, like that's really so. Yeah, it, that makes sense. It's very subjective and it, it can get very disheartening if you let it get to you. Yeah. So, so not only do you need a thick skin, but you need to let all this stuff just go. Cause really like when you're a, when you're a voice actor and they tell you audition and let it go, that's what they mean. Yeah. Because you can't dwell on it. If you, if you are worried about whether or not you got this job and you're, you're focusing on it, then you can't do the next job and you can't focus on the next script. And really, you're not going to know unless you're hired. They're not going to give you any feedback. You're not going to no. know if you really sucked or if you were like the second choice, but they didn't go with you. You right. know, like, you're never going to know <laughs> what that is. So how do, okay, no, that, that makes sense because they have so many people that just want, okay, you got it and that's it. They can't yeah. just call everybody back. That will, that will be so time consuming. Exactly, yes. So, okay, so you're doing addition and all that stuff. So what happened, how did you, make the shift to start helping businesses with it? How did that happen? Well, what I do as a voice actor is one really, really small corner part of the whole audio branding spectrum. Mm -hmm. So really what happened was I got interested. Right. <laughs> 
you know, I was just, I was fascinated by how sound influences our buying behaviors because most of what I do is advertising, commercials, uh, corporate narration, things that create a persona for the clients that I work with. And I don't tend to do audio game, uh, audiobooks and video games and animation. That's not really my my, oh my god, it's so funny that you bring that up. Yeah. See, this is why I'm like ADD because it's like thoughts just <laughs> pop in my head. But I was listening to an audiobook the other day. Mm -hmm. It was what which one was it? It was uh PT Barnum's story. PT oh. Bar PT Bar I don't know I don't even know if I'm pronouncing mm -hmm. it right. PT Barnum. And I have the book, but it's like I can't it's you know what anyway, I don't even know why I'm going to it, but audiobooks for me is better when I'm driving and stuff like that just to oh, get yeah. it done and over with. Well, it's like podcasts. You can do other things while you're listening. I couldn't finish it because I could not stand the guy reading the book. He just uh, had like this okay. voice and he sounded like, I hate to say like a douchebag, like <laughs> this opposite douchebag from like <laughs> Connecticut. And I'm just like, I can't do it. I stopped. Yeah. I, it, but that's how important it is yeah. to match the right voice with the right product, right? It totally is really important. Yeah. And I think a lot of companies make the mistake of getting really, um, focused on what they look like and then not focusing at all on what emotions they want to evoke with those visuals and carrying through with it in their audio. So you can't be a high-end jewelry store and have 80s hairband music on your on hold. That just doesn't make any sense. That is so true. Yeah. I learned right? that in editing back in the day when I was doing yeah. videos and stuff like that. You try to match the right music and how much it's amazing how much audio can make a difference like in a totally in a can. movie scene like oh, try to watch a movie on yeah. mute or like yeah. not on mute but like if you can get a copy of one scene without the music in the background or the sound effects it kills the whole mood it's crazy yeah, yeah. um i actually interviewed on my podcast a sound designer who teaches a course at UNLV on music and film. And one of the things that he mentioned was that he, he teaches people uh, how influential that music is in influencing the scene that you're looking at. And the way that he illustrates this is, I don't know if you saw the movie Christopher Robin, it's several years old now, no. but but the idea being that it was an older Christopher Robin who was visited by like the CGI characters of his childhood. So like Winnie the Pooh and all of these other characters from the books, they were like popping up in his life, like real, right? <laughs> right? Um, and uh, I, you know, so there was a trailer put together for that movie that was very heartwarming and, you know, interesting and dramatic and stuff like that. And then someone took the same scenes sepia colored it a little put different music on it and made it a horror film trailer wow it totally that worked. is so cool and it totally worked <laughs> i believe it mm -hmm. you can, i mean it's amazing what you can do with editing so just with the power same of music scene. and audio same scenes they didn't film anything different they didn't add anything different uh, all they did was move the scenarios around move the scenes around in the trailer and change the music and uh, suddenly Winnie the Pooh is stalking Christopher Robin. <laughs> That's crazy. That's amazing. Like yeah. So it is really amazing how we can influence our emotions with sound and how powerful that is in, in a whole variety of different usages. Like, for instance, think about uh, healthcare, because healthcare, like in a hospital, you're hearing beeps and alarms and people yelling and whatever, like all sorts of things going on. And um, it's really hard as a patient to sleep. It's really hard as a professional working there to actually have a, a stress-free day or or a less stressful day because it's a very stressful environment. Mm -hmm. And there are people working on making some environments within the healthcare, healthcare system more relaxing by sound. So, um, you know, using um, music, using um you know, beats or uh, different ways of calming people down. And, and it actually improves people's ability to recover from illness. That, I mean, that's, uh, I can see how, how they can influence that type of thinking with the, the music that they choose to go with or the narration mm -hmm. or, or environment that they choose to go with. And you don't, you don't work all, I mean, in many, you know, different verticals, like corporate, yeah, corporate hospitality, political. Yeah. Political has to be crazy, especially right now. Yeah. <laughs> Nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Um, so 
when you help these businesses, what, what's the process like? So the business comes in and says, Hey, I need, I need to, to, to work on my branding for this next campaign that we're doing. What's the process like that you walk them through when they, when they come to you? Well, just to, uh, to let you know, I am a voice actor. So that's what I do. Uh, mm -hmm. I generally don't, um, consult on audio branding. There are actually companies that do that specifically, and they do a really good job at it. <laughs> uh, what, I, what I do is I examine the audio branding idea in a broader spectrum, and I talk about it on my podcast. So um, generally, when someone comes to me, they're coming to me for a voiceover. They're, they're not really coming to me for figuring out their brand, but it's, so it's already ready to go. By the time it gets to you, it's already ready to go. Okay. Pretty much. The people that I work with generally um, are the ad agencies and the video production companies and maybe the content marketers and that kind of thing who sort of have a brand in mind and they think my voice would fit with that brand. So they've, gotcha. they've given it some thought, but the end company sometimes isn't quite so sure. So it's, it's a collaboration, really. I mean, we're all going towards the same goal. We're all trying to make sure that the advertising, marketing, whatever is being made is a comprehensive package that makes sense to people hearing it and seeing it. Right. And that matches the brand, that, the, that matches the way that the company wants people to feel about them. So that's that was going to be my, my next question. So when you're, you know, when they come to you, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a they already know you, but if they don't know you, do you have like a demo where you show how oh, you I showcase do. your different, uh, I don't even know what the correct term is, but like <laughs> different, uh, I don't want to say type of voices, but like different, uh, I don't know. Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to go for here? Like, I'm trying to describe, like, do you have yeah. different uh, tones of voice that you use or different voices? How does that work? Because that's like, like I, f I find fascinating because, yeah. you know, I can make a different one. I can tell like this and it's a different one. You know what I mean? Like, so <laughs> how do they know? It's like, you know what? Let me ask Jody. Uh, let, let me present this to Jody because I think she can use, you know, a, a certain type of pitch or whatever for this brand. Is, mm -hmm. is that how it, how it works? Well, generally what, what I have on my website are demos that are split into genres. So there's a okay. demo for commercials. There's a demo for corporate narration. There's a demo for political. There's a demo for TV and show narration. There's a, a you know, a demo for, I do casino work and there's a demo for casino work. Um, there's like all sorts of, of different genres and within those genres, genres that's the word I was looking for. Yeah. yeah. Genres, within yeah. those there, there are separate samples. So you might have five or six different samples that are anywhere from four to 11 seconds long. And they mm -hmm. give you an idea of the different types of tones that can be taken depending on the brand of the company. So um, like for instance, I would sound different if I was doing a Google ad than I would be if I was doing um, you know, a job for a bank. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's, um, you know, if I'm doing retail, if I'm doing something for like Ashley Furniture or uh, then, you know, there's there's something there that is different than, say, um, Holiday Inn. You know, like there's right, right. there's a different tone and, and a different way of communicating the information. And generally, a lot of hints are in the script that you're given. So part of my job is also interpreting what I'm reading, what I'm seeing on the script that they've presented to me. How does that translate out into audio? So how do I convey the message that I care about this, that I'm having a conversation with someone about this, and mm -hmm. that it's important? That's, and, you know, every company wants to be important, right? I mean, right. Of course. Yeah. So and that's when like the acting part comes with it. You got to You got to project that yeah. message when you're doing it. And it's just like, again, it comes back to the, to, to the music that you choose or mm -hmm. like, well, if we're talking about media buying or ads in general, you know, what angle are you going to use for your ad? What type of creative, what's the yeah. best graphic to use? You know, all that stuff, the audio too, like the music to set yeah. the mood or whatever. So like but I pay attention to that bad. stuff, but most people don't, right? Normal yeah. people don't. Yeah. yeah. It's often it's a, it's a last minute thought. It's just an afterthought and they don't give it much thought, but, but for me, it's, what emotion do you want your clients to feel when they see and hear your company? When they right. get that whole package of your company and they think, who are you? 
you know, what emotions do you want them to feel? That should inform what you use for your audio and what you use for your visual. I think uh, high in, it needs to be consistent. Yeah, and I think a, a perfect example of people who don't pay attention to this stuff, it's like when you're watching TV or something, just or even when ads come up on YouTube, like mm -hmm. listen to the difference between an ad for like Disney, mm -hmm. an ad for Coca-Cola, yeah, and an ad for a prescription pill. <laughs> you know, what? it's yeah. completely different. Like the mood yeah. is complete. Even car sales, complete. It's different. It's diff. It's different tones and different. Uh, yeah. You know, car, projection. For instance, each car type has a certain way they like to sound and a certain look that they have when you watch their. Like Maserati is going to be different from Jeep. You know. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's going to be yeah. different from Toyota. Is going to be different from you know, name your car. Perfect example. Watch a, watch a Chevy Ford ad yeah. and then watch a Cadillac commercial or Mercedes Benz. Totally. It's completely different because exactly. they know who the demographics are, right? Exactly. And that's so, why I find some fascinating. Yeah. You want to be able to communicate with the people that you feel are your tribe mm -hmm. and, and be able to um, impress upon them that you're like them. Yeah. That, that you are their people. That makes it's, <laughs> Right. This is ads marketing one on one, people. Yeah. So you better be paying attention. Yeah, absolutely. So it's marketing one on one, but add the audio component because that is a part of it and it should be a part of it and it should not be an afterthought. <laughs> oh, no, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. So, okay. So it's like if somebody wants to get into voice acting, mm -hmm. you know, nowadays, obviously you have plenty of experience. You've been doing this for a long time, but let's say, because you know what? Sometimes I, I actually do follow voice actors on TikTok out of all platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. so a, are you are you on there? Are you using it? On TikTok? No? Oh my God, you need to get on it like right now. Oh, it's organic. I'm not even on Instagram. I'm like, I, I'm. You need to get yeah. on TikTok. Like it's huge. Like voice <laughs> acting is huge. Yeah. Yes, I'm telling you. Like, if you want to know more about it, we can talk about it later or whatever. But I, yeah. Yeah, it's up to you. <laughs> uh, but um, so. It's crazy because they'll do they'll they'll record themselves reading and stuff like that, and the way they change their voice is mm -hmm. super super. It's amazing to watch. But people ask in the comments all the time. It's like, oh my god, I want to do it. Like people don't even know this is the thing. Like, how do I? I can make a career of this. I can make a business out of this. Yeah. So if it was today, without the background that you have, and somebody mm -hmm. wants to get into voice acting because they love it, I mean, how do you recommend for them to start in in that field? The very first thing I would have them do is go to a website called voiceoverextra.com. And the reason for that is because there is so much free information on that website, articles, webinars you can take for like 50 bucks, um, ideas of who the reputable coaches are, what you need for a demo, business side of it. Because believe me, if you're going to get into this right now, you're going to wear a lot of hats. So not only am I speaking into a mic on a regular basis, I'm also my own audio engineer. I am my own promoter. I'm, I'm my own marketing person. Um, you can outsource some of this once you get going, but in the beginning, you're doing all this yourself. You are a business person. You are an entrepreneur, so you better know how to invoice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, get paid up front. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and you need to have a home studio. So right. because especially now in the era of COVID, um, mm -hmm. none of the studios, some of them are open depending on where you are, but a lot of them are not. And you need to have a minimum of certain things to have a home studio in order to actually get work in this business yeah. right now. So uh, there's a lot that goes into it. And I would say research that, research everything on that website, see the lay of the land, understand what you're getting into. And then if you have questions, you're welcome to reach out to me. <laughs> that's amazing. So that's cool. By the way, which you you sound amazing, obviously, because it's <laughs> what you do for a living. So I was going to ask you, like, I, before, like, what kind of mic you're using? Because it sounds great. So, well, this is the this is a Sennheiser four sixteen. So this is a boom mic, basically. It's okay, like, all right. That's yeah. why it sounds so good. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. But these are not cheap mics. No, they're not and cheap mics. No, not at all. And uh, and it is something that you gear yourself up. But to. if you want to get started, you can start with something simple. I mean, oh, yeah, totally. you don't need a condenser mic is what you need as opposed to a dynamic mic when you're doing voiceover because you need the nuance of a condenser. What's the difference between the two for people that don't know? 
Well, dynamic, you can kind of like dynamic is more for live performance and it mm -hmm. cuts out all of the background of your environment. It cuts out a lot of it. So for podcasters, it's fantastic. It really yeah. can help a lot. But when you're talking about voiceovers, you need to not be muffled. <laughs> right. And a dynamic mic can muffle you a little bit. You want all of the great stuff about your voice to come through and be able to be heard by an engineer on the other end because you're passing that audio file to someone else who's making a production of what you give them and you want to be able to have a good environment a good sound treated environment so that you can give them as dead a sound as possible so they can color it as they want to on their end awesome and uh all right so I just have to ask because I'm curious like that. But mm -hmm. uh, so let's talk about the podcast. How long have you been doing the podcast for? I started in November 2019. Okay. To, uh, I think I'm up to number 45. You're ahead of me. I started this one in November 19 too. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I did. Yeah. It's hard work, huh? It is hard work. I it's have a lot fun. of help. I am it's very fun. lucky that I have a lot of help. Um, my audio engineer who puts everything together after I pass him the files is a guy named Umberto Franco from Portugal. He's another really talented voice actor and does some wonderful work on his own. But he's also really good at this whole audio engineering thing. And he loves it. And I'm happy to pass that off to someone who loves it. <laughs> That's awesome. So what, hold on, what's the name of the podcast? Because I don't think I have it in front of me. It's called Audio Branding. The How hidden brand? Brand of marketing. <laughs> awesome. And I'm going to put all the links in the description too. Mm -hmm. Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, all that good stuff, YouTube. Yep. Uh, so since you started the podcast, what, what have you learned so far? It hasn't been, it, oh this goodness. is your first podcast, right? Uh, actually, it's the second one. I started one in June of 2019 and it was on a completely different topic. It was self-care for creatives. <laughs> yeah. It was called Jody's Silver Linings, and it only nice. had 30 episodes, and that was it. And right. what happened was I started getting asked to be a life coach. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, and I just I just You don't want to do it. No, no you got to do what you like. Wedding. No, I was, just, you like. I was just, you know, saying some things that I had been thinking and that seemed like common sense to me, and, you yeah. know, people liked it. So <laughs> I don't That's know. That's good. That's a good start. It's okay. Yeah, I, I learned a lot. I did learn a lot while I was doing that. And then when I started this new one, I um, I was doing podcast episodes that were only around five minutes or so. If I was doing a solo episode, I would do a few of those. And I just yeah. wanted to bring up some topics on audio that I was interested in and that people hadn't really talked about. That it was sort of one of, it was on the sidelines and people hadn't really, you know, focused on it. But I think when I read uh, Gary Vee's article on audio branding, I I was like, okay, I'm on to something here. <laughs> what was what was the article? I mean, I, I, I've seen so much stuff from him. He, but, had, yeah. he had done an article that was around audio branding because I think he has like a swoosh or beat sound or something on all of his videos now. Yeah, he does. Um, he does. Yeah. So so he had deliberately done that. Uh, because he realized that audio branding was a thing and it was right. an important thing. <laughs> yeah. He's been on the audio kick for years now. Yeah. I mean, for years. Yeah. I mean, when he gets obsessed with something, he'll talk about it every day, 20,000 times a day and well, beat it Europe to death. Is way ahead of the game with us. Like with this, Europe has got it down. Like they, they had been doing this for years and years and years, but I think there's a book called audio branding. I can't remember who wrote it, but it's from 2010, actually. There's okay. a ton of in information in that. It's really, really interesting. And I've just interviewed a lot of really interesting people who work in this particular genre. That's going to be my next question. So in the podcast, who have, who have you had on that just like kind of blew your mind or like somebody you weren't expecting to like <laughs> give you a, a, a another point of view on something that you already knew like what's been your favorite so far let's put it that way oh i have i have to mention and i always mention it in my trailer on the website as well uh steve keller who is the St the sonic strategy director for pandora uh, oh wow yeah um he is also in charge of all their all of their advertising so um he runs a advertising um arm of Pandora because there are lots of people who advertise on Pandora and sound design is a huge big thing for that. Uh, he had 
done a whole bunch of stuff previous. And he actually had a TED talk that I found him on. Um, That's cool. Previous to that. And he, when he, when we talked and it was a two part episode, Oh my God, he blew my mind, like in so many different ways. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Well, he was the one I heard about the healthcare thing from, and yeah. he had done a promotion for a, I guess it was a, a an electrolyte drink called Propel. Yeah. And okay. when, when Propel first came out, they were trying to figure out, uh, they were trying to get the word out. And Pandora put together this thing, this gathering, where you could go to a, a, a DJ kind of station, put on headphones, and through the dial, um, while you're tasting the drink, you could listen to something in your ears, and you could dial in how the, the drink tasted more salty or more sweet. What? From what you were hearing. That is crazy. Yeah. I have yeah. to listen to this podcast. Yeah. It's really, really <laughs> cool. I think it's episode 19. So okay, I'm gonna look. I'm gonna write it down because I want to check that out. But yeah, like he just he talked about all sorts of stuff like that. So there is a connection in our brain between our our hearing and our our sense of smell, actually. Um, so like like a a big connection, and those are our two most powerful senses. So if you think about that, then there's there's a synergy that happens in all our senses and they all influence each other there was another uh this was i think just before i spoke to him about this but i know that he had sort of been involved in this sort of thing as well there there was a study that was done through an advertising type uh journal where they had studied how people's buying habits were changed by what they were hearing in the store. So I've seen, people, I've seen some of those studies, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so people would go into a wine store, and if French music was playing on the PA, then they would buy more French wine. And it was like almost 70%. That's crazy. I mean, it's been a while since I've seen one of those studies, but I remember seeing one years ago. I'm yeah. talking about like probably a decade ago. But it, and, it influences it influences what we buy. It influences how we taste. Um, and this was another thing. They actually had thought about, uh, and I think this was mentioned in a white paper that he co-wrote with, with a scientist. They mentioned that if you were to um, send a certain music or a sound or something like that to someone who is diabetic, for instance, and really likes sweet, you could influence how they experienced sweet while they were eating in a hospital by what you were playing for them. <coughs> That's crazy. My yeah. God, that is, that is so amazing. <laughs> I could talk about this all day. This is so fascinating. I could totally too, which is why I, <laughs> I love doing the podcast because yeah. I'm learning a ton. Like this is just like, like I said, I'm one small little tiny corner of this whole audio branding spectrum of unbelievable stuff. <laughs> and everyone I talk to gives me a new perspective. Um, I've spoken to a guy who is a confidence coach for youth who mm -hmm. teaches them how to be more confident through hip hop. That's so he cool. Uses music to do that. That's um, pretty awesome. And yeah, that was pretty awesome. I talked, I talked to a guy who does uh, binaural beats and how that can influence your um, moods and your mindset and all of that stuff. And, uh, I've talked to sound engineers, I've talked to speaking coaches, I've talked to storytellers, I've talked to musicians. It's just, it's it's so much a part of everything we do. And yet in advertising, it's it's often this like- It's overlooked. Oh, yeah, we'll just do that. Okay, yeah. use that music. Just yeah. throw that something on there. But I it's actually- so uh, powerful. It can it be is. so powerful. <laughs> it is. And then I, I actually read somewhere and this, this makes so much sense. And I read this years and years and years and years ago. I don't remember how long ago, mm -hmm. but I read somewhere that uh, the reason why we have favorite artists or favorite bands is because when you're a kid, you get used to that voice. Mm -hmm. And no matter what they put out, since you listen to it so much, whether it was growing up with your parents was like the thing to listen to at the time, no matter what they put out after that, you can, it's a brand new CD 20 years later and you turn it on and you will instantly love it because you grew up with that, that sound of the, the, the you know, the singer and yeah. the singer basically. And no matter what, once you hear that sound, it releases dopamine in your brain. And they're like, this is, this is my, 
this is my jam, right? Yeah, I was going to say yeah. something else, but you know, so there's, which there's makes perfect stuff. sense yeah. because I look back at my favorite bands growing up mm -hmm. and still to the, I mean, number one is Metallica I was a kid because I was introduced to it when I was a kid by my neighbor and mm -hmm. no matter what Metallica puts out, it's like, as soon as it comes out, I love it. Right. I mean, yeah, it's, it might be, not be the best, you know, I, I, you know, like it was back then and certain, <laughs> you know, thing, yeah. whatever. I don't even know how to describe it, but I still love it because that's my band. And then what? like the other bands that I grew up listening to, it's the same thing. It's like, it just, it clicks. And I guess that's why we have like a favorite genre of music. Like when I was growing up, I was all about heavy metal. Like I wouldn't listen to anything else. Mm -hmm. But as I grew up older and mature, I started listening to other types of music like hip hop or classical or techno or whatever. And now I listen to, I listen, I like, I love Britney and Lady Gaga, you know, it's like, <laughs> I listen to anything, mm -hmm. but there's only that one genre that's like our genre, no matter what. And yeah. I guess it has to do with the way you grew up, right? It, I mean, that's how influential music and sounds can be. Well, it trans ports you back to where you were when you first heard it. If yeah. one, of, one of the other interviews, um, the fellow that I was telling you about who teaches the film and music course at UNLV, he's mm -hmm. a sound designer. And one of the other things that he mentioned in our, um, in our interview, his name is John McLean. And he mentioned in our interview that you can use sound to time travel because I believe it. Yeah. What it does is it actually takes you, you hear a sound like, a squeak on a floorboard in a house that mm -hmm. echoes and you're like back in your mom's kitchen. Like, yeah, you're there. Like, no, a hundred percent. Yeah. There's certain so, songs. There's certain songs yeah. that come on. And as soon as I hear it, it's like you said, time travel. I'm there at that at one specific moment in time. And I can like vividly see it in my head. Like yeah. there's one song it's by corn and it's, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, follow the leader. I said, that's the name of the song. Mm -hmm. And I, it's one of those songs that I don't listen to, but if it comes up in my playlist, yeah, I love it. But for some reason, that song, as soon as I hear like that first beat, it literally takes me back to a point when I was 18 mm -hmm. and I was in the car and I was going to my friend's house and it was like 1 a.m. and it was a day that I snuck out of the house. And for some reason, that's the song that was on. Yeah. But I can see myself in my Jeep with the green clock in the dashboard driving yeah. on Red Bug Boulevard in Orlando yeah. towards their house. Like it's nuts. Like, and it's yeah. so vivid in my brain. It's crazy. It's so imagine what you can powerful. do with branding and advertising. If you pair up the right, you know, sounds and music or soundtrack to your ads, right? Yes. Well, the thing about advertising is it's not effective unless it's memorable. Right. right. You need to remember who that advertiser is and you need to remember what they were asking you to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, unless it does those things, it's not effective advertising. Mm -hmm. So the the best way to be consistent and memorable in an advertisement or a presentation of your company is to meld those two things together, the visual and the audio. Because if you don't do that, your presentation or your ad or your web video or whatever, it's not nearly as powerful as it could be. And it's not as memorable. It just, it just isn't. You need that, you need that all around sensory experience in order to really understand what you're being asked to experience <laughs> and get in people's heads yeah. <laughs> they can remember you but, but yeah right. that's that's advertising that's what advertising should be i think that's the best <laughs> way to end this with that explanation jody yeah. thank you so much i could literally go on all day but we've been going this for over true. an hour i think this yeah. is the longest podcast i've done so far in this channel yet which is awesome i don't mind it at all like <laughs> honestly this is one of the most enjoyable experiences i had doing this and I'm you're glad. definitely gonna have to come <laughs> on again at some point uh, I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll we'll plan it. We'll plan a little bit better. We'll 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 make it even more fun. But okay. listen, I'm fascinated by the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, guys, look her up if you want to know more about branding. If you need uh, voice talent uh, for your campaigns, uh, where can everybody find you? Oh, before I forget, you mm -hmm. also had a PDF. Was it the PDF yeah. uh, with the free uh, point? Uh, what was it? The tips? Yes. For that? Top five tips for implementing an intentional audio strategy. Yes. There you go. Where can they go find that? Uh, that is on my website at voiceoversandvocals.com slash audio dash branding dash strategy. 
All right, cool. And where else can people find you? I'm sure Facebook, <laughs> LinkedIn, yeah. you Twitter. Look Jody Krangle, anywhere. J O D I, no, no E. <laughs> <laughs> J O D I. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's K K R A N G L E. Uh, my website is voiceoversandvocals.com and it's voiceovers, plural. And the podcast is at audiobrandingpodcast.com. Awesome. Guys, mm -hmm. check that out. I mean, I, I hope you find this as, as entertaining and fascinating as I did. And uh, I'll put all the links in the description. So make sure to check it out. All right, Jody, thank you. Thank, right, you, thank you so you. much. We'll definitely do this again soon. Okay. Mm -hmm.